So uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, this presentation is based on an article published in the journal Addiction. Uh, I don't have any competing interests with the tobacco or pharmaceutical or e-cigarette industries. Um, of course, if we speak of e-cigarettes, as you know, there's a huge variety of, of products and uh, nicotine concentrations. So we must always keep this in mind when, when discussing this issue. Uh, we'll discuss the gateway theory, which is uh, a, a very popular theory. Actually, it's a causal theory. It's a theory that says that use of one drug causes use of another, usually more dangerous drug. And it's not specifically a scientific theory. Actually, it's a hybrid of popular academic and media accounts. It's extremely popular, at least since the 1970s, and it's, used, it's been used to support the idea that marijuana causes heroin use. Of course, the theory has always been controversial because of the difficulty to eliminate alternative explanations. Uh, the objective of this presentation is to examine whether the gateway theory has value in the case of uh, vaping and smoking, to uh, discuss whether the criteria to establish causality are met, and also to discuss what type of evidence, what type of studies would be needed to test this theory. And, and we spend some time discussing causality because it's a, it's a causal theory. Why does this uh, gateway theory matter? Why is it important to understand the in and outs of, of this theory? Because it has enormous political influence. For instance, the EU Tobacco Products Directive about 10 years ago already stated that electronic cigarettes can develop into a gateway to nicotine addiction and ultimately traditional tobacco consumption. For this reason, it is appropriate to adopt a restrictive approach. And, and of course, as you know, uh, that's exactly what the Tobacco Products Directive uh, do. Um, and the gateway theory is a central argument, perhaps the main argument of opponents to uh, new technologies that vaporize uh, tobacco or nicotine. And they also argue that ISIX could be a gateway to illicit drug use. So how are we going to assess causality? How do we know that two things are causally linked, not just associated, but causally linked? Well, we can use an old paper by a well-known epidemiologist, Austin Bradford Hill, who more than half a century ago uh, published a paper uh, called The Environment and Disease Association or Causation. And in this paper, he underline nine aspects or viewpoints. It doesn't call them criteria, but viewpoints, things that you might want to think about when you think about causality. First, the strength of the association. You want the association to be strong enough in order to believe it. Second, the consistency. You want different investigators, different trials conducted in different populations to find the same results. You're going to believe the theory more if, if the results are consistent. You want the association to be specific. You, you, you want to rule out other possible explanation, make sure that uh, other things are not the cause of the, of the association. You want to establish whether the cause precedes the effect, which is not necessarily obvious in, in our case. You want to see whether there's a dose response, uh, whether if you increase the dose, then the, uh, the risk and the response increases too. You want to have an explanation. You want the, the link to be plausible. You, have, you want to have a biological or psychological explanation. You don't always have it, but it would be good to have uh, a plausible explanation. You're also looking for coherence. You want to know whether the association is consistent with other lines of evidence. And we'll, we'll come to this later. Of course, uh, you, when possible, you want to do an experiment. In our case, we're talking about uh, ex experiment means uh, randomized controlled trials. Uh, 
And finally, the criteria or rather the viewpoint of analogy. Do similar agents like uh, nicotine patches and gums or smokeless tobacco act similarly? Let's start with experiments. Uh, uh, Bradford Hill said, here, the strongest support for the causation hypothesis may be revealed. Of course, randomizing people to either vaping, uh, I mean, non-vapers and non-smokers, randomizing them to uh, either vaping and not vaping is not feasible. So you can't have experiments here and you must rely on observational studies, preferably uh, follow-up studies, longitudinal studies with uh, a reliable assessment of behaviors measured at the right time because we want to assess uh, temporality, antecedents. Studies that assess smoking uptake, which is a non-repeatable event. People start smoking their first cigarettes, smoke their first cigarettes just once. So you want to capture this non-repeatable event. Of course, because you can't rely on experiment, you, you must adjust for, for confounders and you must have a comprehensive measurement of confounders and sophisticated statistical analysis to take uh, confounding effects into account. Uh, can these conditions be met? Well, uh, hardly, because in this field, we must rely on questionnaires, on self-reports by teens, by teenagers, and we know that they are not reliable. And so people will be misclassified and even very small rates of misclassification will make uh, statistical adjustment for confounders uh, very difficult or impossible. The strengths of the association, um, well, if um, there is any effect, then because our measures are imprecise, because we rely on questionnaires in teenagers that are unreliable, then the effects will need to be large uh, to be detectable be because our, our measures are not precise enough to detect very small effects. Uh, and we can doubt whether small effects can ever be detected in observational studies uh, based on, on questionnaires. And uh, also, uh, relatively few non-smokers have taken up smoking in, in, in studies. So the population effect, I mean, the relative risk applied to the number of users is likely to be small. But of course, this may change uh, with new products uh, containing uh, high concentration nicotine salts, which may be more addictive than uh, older products. And uh, then the viewpoint of consistency. Are the results consistent across trials, across investigators, across populations? Well, no, not at all. There's a wide variation of results. And also the, um, the literature is heavily biased. People have strong positions uh, either for or against uh, the gateway theory. And this is reflected in the results of their studies. And a very good predictor of the results of the studies is just the name of the author. You look at the name of the author, and if you know his past publication and his opinion, you, you're very likely to know what the results are going to be even before you read the abstract of the study. So it's a, it's a huge problem in this field. Um, the many studies are biased in one way or the other. Um, and also, as we just said, e-cigarettes are not a single product, but a wide range of product that changes all the time. There's a, there's a constant flow of new products. The, uh, the, the, uh, the producer are extremely innovative, so it changes all the time. And also the, the social context changes all the time because um, the, uh, the regulations on access and availability change, the marketing changes, the what's happening on social media on, on, on also on the mainstream media, the information to the public, uh, the social context, all this changes all the time. And also the, uh, the association between vaping and smoking will depend on the on other elements 
of the contacts, like the, the prevalence of vaping and smoking in a given population, the existing anti-smoking and anti-vaping policies in, in, in a given country at a given time. This also uh, varies geographically and over time, and it's going to make the results of studies uh, often not generalizable to, to other contexts, rapidly obsolete and unreliable. So uh, it makes things very complicated. Is the association specific? Do we, can we exclude other things that can cause smoking? What other things are we speaking about here? Well, um, we are looking at two behaviors that are extremely similar. In both cases, we are looking at people who inhale a vapor or smoke containing nicotine and, and tobacco flavor much of the time or menthol flavor much of the time in both cases. So the two behaviors are extremely similar. And of course, because they are so close and so similar, they are going to be caused by the same things. And it's going to be very difficult to disentangle what specifically uh, is causal between vaping and smoking and what is due to other causes. And what are these other causes? Well, social influences, of course. Family and friends who both smoke and vape will have a huge influence on, on what teenagers do. Also, personality traits. For instance, risk-taking and novelty-seeking will increase the risk of both smoking and, and vaping. The use of other tobacco products and other drugs, behavioral problems and psychiatric problems, as you know, are strongly linked to um, to substance use, including nicotine. Genetic factors will also determine whether people will like or not a nicotine once they try it. So all these elements make, uh, make it both more likely to vape and to smoke. This is a common susceptibility theory. People who are susceptible to smoke are also susceptible to vape uh, because the same causes uh, cause the, the two behaviors. And it's, you'll have to measure all these variables that I just listed with extreme precision. And, and you need to measure all of these variables if you want to have a, a good multivariate model that really adjusts for all these confounders. And of course, it's not likely to occur. You're not likely to find many studies that measure all these things that I just mentioned and in addition, that measures them correctly in order to avoid residual confounding. So it's almost unavoidable to have residual confounding in these uh, observational studies of vaping and smoking. And the residual confounding uh, explains the association rather than a direct link between vaping and smoking. It's something that's extremely important to keep in mind when you, um, when you look at the, at the gateway theory. Uh, so, um, the, the two behaviors are caused by the same thing. This is a common liability theory, which is uh, a good theory to explain the association between vaping and smoking, because it is supported by a large body of scientific evidence. It also accounts for the dose response effect, and uh, it also has Another advantage, it provides a good foundation for research and policy because you can tackle much of these things, like the social influences, for instance, the regulation. A lot of things you, uh, are amenable to interventions. Temporality. Do we know uh, whether the cause precedes the effect? Well, in our case, it's often going to be very hard to establish antecedents, to make sure that people first vape, then smoked, because much of the time, the two behaviors co-occur. They occur more or less at the same time. And all we have is self-report questionnaires uh, on past behaviors and things that occurred perhaps six months or one year ago, uh, self-reported by teenagers. This is uh, a very imprecise an unreliable way to measure things. And um, so, so it's, it's going to be very hard to establish the, uh, the temporality and the precedence. And also another point 
is that the second the sequence of product use, it is first vaping, then smoking, this sequence can be explained by the sequence of opportunities to use the products rather than by uh, an inherent capacity of vaping to cause smoking. I mean, uh, kids or teenagers are going to use first the products that's most available to them or that's most fashionable or that their friends use. And if this product is, is uh, an e-cigarette, then they're going to use this. And they're only going to smoke later because perhaps smoking is perceived as more risky or cigarettes are less available, less fashionable in some contexts, in some situations. So it's also an important point to remember that the sequence of product use is explained not by a causal link between vaping and smoking, but just because uh, vaping is perhaps more available and they meet vaping first uh, they meet e-cigarettes first before they, they meet uh, combustible cigarettes. Uh, and, and this explains the, the antecedents. And um, much of the evidence that will be presented to you about the gateway effect come from such longitudinal studies that have uh, two elements. They, they establish antecedents and then an increased risk of smoking among those who vape and you Currently, you have also a lot of meta-analysis of these studies. So is it satisfactory? Should we believe uh, the meta-analysis or all the numerous studies that have established antecedents and an increased risk of, of smoking? Is it enough for us to believe that the gateway theory is true? Um, well, perhaps not. It's not enough, actually because uh, these type of studies and meta-analyses do not eliminate confounding by other factors, because much of the time, the studies that were used were uh, studies first designed for other purposes. They were not studies specifically designed to assess the gateway effect. Most of the time, these are large studies conducting, conducted in young people that assess only a very limited number of confounders, not all the confounders. So you have a lot of residual confounding in, the, in these studies. And doing a meta-analysis of these sort of studies does not um, eliminate the problem of the residual confounding, on the contrary. And also uh, an, another problem is that many of these uh, follow-up studies fail to report a measure of duration and intensity of the vaping before subsequent smoking. So you don't know whether it's only a single puff or regular vaping. And also the subsequent smoking is often experimental rather than regular smoking. So all these are limits of, the, uh, of these studies. And there are many of them of antecedents and increased risk. The next uh, viewpoint is plausibility. Is it plausible that vaping causes smoking? Well, there, there are reasons to think that it is plausible. For instance, the gestures, the inhalation of, of vapor, the route of administration is, is, is the same, uh, the flavors, the contact with smokers in, in smoking and vaping out those areas, perhaps even changes in the brain, in the nicotinic receptors, addiction to nicotine, all these are plausible explanation of why um, vaping may cause smoking. Uh, um, but of course, also we must say that most current cigarettes model are not very addictive, uh, but this may change with uh, nicotine salts and products like Juul who provide more nicotine and maybe more addictive. And also, if nicotine supply is not sufficient when you vape, then uh, instead of smoking instead, you, people could just switch to uh, e-cigarette model that provide more nicotine. There are also reasons to believe that it's not very plausible because well, cigarettes are available everywhere and very easily, and there's no need for a gateway for kids to, to smoke because cigarettes are so easily available. And also, why would people who choose to vape rather than smoke change their mind and suddenly start smoking? And in fact, most teenagers start by uh, smoking. The, 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 uh, the antecedents are the 
temporality goes in the other way around. They first smoke, then vape. And uh, many people vape because they look for alternatives to smoking that are safer or cheaper or more socially accept acceptable. Is uh, this association consistent with other lines of evidence? This is a coherent viewpoint. Um, well, if vaping caught smoking, then in countries where vaping increases among teens, we should observe an increase in smoking too, but it's not what we see. If you look at the UK, for instance, you look at the uh, black and gray bars between 2013 and 2019, you see that vaping increased in youth, 11 to 18 years old in the UK. But if you look at smoking prevalence in, in, the, uh, in this age group, it decreased actually between 17% in 2013 and 12% in 2018. So, so the expected association is not seen here. And, and the same in the US. In the US, vaping became popular among youth uh, during the past 10 years, but this is also the time when smoking decreased the most rapidly in this group, with only 4% of uh, 12 grade students smoking daily currently. But of course, you, we must be careful when using these arguments because the association between vaping prevalence and smoking prevalence is uh, no proof actually against or for the gateway theory because it's very hard to derive causal inferences from uh, this sort of data. And during the same time, teens also started to drink less. They started to have sex later perhaps because they go out less, because they use mobile phones, they spend more time at home using mobile phones and social networks. This may explain why they smoke less, drink less, and start sex later. Do similar agents like nicotine medications and smoke less tobacco act similarly? Uh, I mean, do they uh, have a gateway effect? First, nicotine medications are not very addictive. They are designed by the pharmaceutical industry not to be addictive. And I don't know of any reported case of uh, a non-user of tobacco who first got addicted to nicotine medications and then switched to smoking to satisfy this addiction. This doesn't exist. And for smoke less tobacco, there are reviews who have examined this, this and they conclude that smoke less tobacco does not appear to be a gateway to smoking. And as you know, of course, in countries like Sweden, where snus is very much used, in particular by men, smoking prevalence is extremely low. This is red bar here at the bottom of the graph. Uh, smoking prevalence in Sweden is uh, much, much lower than anywhere else. Um, I, I'll skip this because I want to save some time for, for questions. Um, the gateway theory and the common liability theory are not mutually exclusive. It's also possible that the common liability theory explains the initiation of the sequence. Uh, why It may explain why people first start vaping, but then progression to regular vaping may depend on enabling and reinforcing factors like the availability of the product, the inhalation practice, the addiction, um, that then may have a causal effect on, on subsequent smoking. What do um, respected bodies say about the gateway effect? Well, the UK Royal College of Physicians in 2000, it appears to date that concern over gateway progression into smoking are unfounded. The association is more likely due to common liability. Public Health England reports uh, also, uh, this report also concludes in the same direction that never smokers in the UK who try cigarettes are more likely to try smoking, but a causal link has not been established. Then you have the uh, US National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine report, who says that uh, there is substantial evidence that uh, vaping by use increases the risk of ever smoking, that is, of smoking at least one cigarette. But 
uh, a point in the report that is much less often science cited, and you must go to the uh, page 19 of the report to see that the uh, National Academy also concludes that it is unclear whether this increase in ever use results in an increased adult initiation rate, that is uh, regular use. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip a couple of, um, of slides uh, to uh, get to the conclusions and leave sometimes for the questions. Um, Uh, I think that the gateway hypothesis currently, because the literature is so biased, it's it's awfully biased in one way or, or the other. People are so um, partisan uh, that it's very hard to conclude anything. Also, because you know we don't have experiments, we must rely on observational data that are not very reliable. A lot of the studies that we have are observational studies that do not measure confounding factors comprehensively or, or correctly. So uh, it's very hard to be confident and say that there is or there isn't a gateway because the evidence is scarce and inconclusive. And many of the studies are biased. The experts strongly disagree. Uh, it's difficult to obtain good evidence uh, but uh, some studies are very interesting, like, like the uh, studies just presented by Abigail, very interesting studies of the effects of, uh, of regulations. Many of the uh, criteria of causality of the um, viewpoints of Bradford Hill are, are not met, are not documented, or if they are documented, they're not met. And uh, Anyway, the use update of e-cigarettes is, is currently low, in, in at least in Europe and in the UK, where there's a lot of vaping. They have managed to uh, avoid uh, a large uptake of vaping in youth while having a lot of people who smoke and while promoting, uh, who vape and while promoting vaping. So they are, I think they were able to manage these things correctly. The common liability theory is also plausible. It is a good base for policy. Uh, but it doesn't mean that there's no causal pathway. There may be a causal pathway, uh, in particular because of addiction and contact with smokers. But if there is a gateway effect, the best response is perhaps not to prohibit vaping, but to reduce access to cigarettes, because the problem is cigarettes rather than, rather than vaping. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the right response would be to reduce their access to cigarettes and to decrease the number of adults who smoke. Uh, anyway, the, this, this gateway theory has enormous political influence and its success is perhaps explained by its simplicity, it's a simple theory, and its efficacy politically. It's very, it's very efficient politically, even uh, if, as we said, it, it's going to be very hard to either prove it or unprove it um, with confidence. I stop here. You'll have time to read the paper in addiction or I'll share my slides. So you'll have time to read the slides that I didn't have time to present. Thanks a lot. And we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you, Professor Ettel, for this um, nice and um, critical appraisal of the gateway theory. So you, as a public health expert um, in Switzerland, where do you see now the, the major um, role of regulation in, in Switzerland? Um, in regulation, in well, we have a, a new law, the Swiss parliament just uh, voted a new law on tobacco products that allows uh, e-cigarettes on the market where well, they were already allowed but now it's in the law but otherwise the law doesn't have any teeth it was it, it was stripped of any effect by the parliament over six years the parliament needed six years to vote this law and and the federal council itself in his message uh, accompanying the law says that the law will have no effect on the number of smokers in Switzerland. So this, this law will, will, won't have any effect. Switzerland 
uh, as you may know, ranks very low in the tobacco control index, among the lowest in the in the assessed countries. So uh, uh, the perspectives here from the legal perspectives are not, not very good. Yes. Any other question? And there is another question from the audience whether this um, whole debate um, is not um, or should be more seen or debated from a moral perspective rather than a scientific perspective. Uh, well, the two are not completely separate. There's no reason why uh, the, the ethics considerations should, should not be taken into account. Um, I, I think a moral perspective uh, comes into account when you consider our legitimacy. As public health professional, what is our legitimacy? We're legitimate to intervene and to restrict people's freedom if this reduces the number of people who die or other people who, who fall sick of smoking. But if our interventions have other goals, uh, I mean, other goals rather than decreasing mortality and morbidity, then I think we should have a serious discussion about whether this is legitimate. I mean, do we have a right to tell people not to use nicotine uh, if, if the nicotine is not in smoke? And what is the basis for our intervention in this? in this case. So this is this is a debate that has not taken place, I think, to a sufficient extent. Okay, then there is another question from the audience. And um, I apologize, I do not know the, the study which the question refers to, but the question refers to the OFDT study in France which show that teenagers who have tried vaping are roughly 40% less likely to be smokers at age 18 than those who have not tried vaping. Is it to be understood as an example of reverse causality? Or does it exemplify that the gateway theory um, Okay, yes, I, I get the question. Uh, I don't know these specific studies, these specific French study, I have not, have not read it. Uh, you have results in both directions. We have, you have many, many of the studies that show that uh, vaping increases the later uh, risk of, of, uh, of taking up smoking. But um, as I said in the presentation, antecedents and increased risk are not sufficient because much of the time confounding factors are not measured. So I don't know how confounding factors were assessed in the particular French study. It would be interesting to look at. But uh, also, uh, I, I could take the opportunity to say a word about what sort of evidence, what sort of studies do we need to establish whether or not there's a gateway effect? And intervention studies and randomized trials are not completely excluded. For instance, we can imagine randomizing uh, vapors to uh, vaping cessation interventions or randomizing people to educational interventions, for instance. Uh, that aim to delay the onset of both vaping and smoking. And of course, there are all the, the very nice natural experiments of regulations presented by Abigail, which I think are, are also very convincing and, and very strong arguments in, in this debate. These, uh, the effects of uh, taxes, flavor bans, uh, vaping bans on, on both vaping and smoking. These are very, very interesting and useful results in this debate, I think. So there are no further questions from... So thank you very much for your attention.